Yes, this is 49ers Talk, an emergency podcast 49ers Talk without the sirens blaring, although I think there's some construction work going out on outside your residence, Jennifer. Uh, and I'm joined by Jennifer Lee Chan. I'm Matt. And we have news. We've suspected for quite some time that something is going on with Debo Samuel. And we certainly don't know the extent of everything quite yet. But he did tell Jeff Darlington from ESPN that he has requested a trade. I don't know, Jennifer, after you and I spoke, uh, when was that? Tuesday night, that this comes as a shock to either of us because we've been hearing rumors and stuff, nothing really that we could report, but there's a lot of chatter out there about Debo Samuel's discontent, which he made public, basically, when he scrubbed all mentions of the 49ers off his social media. Yeah, just like you said, there's anytime there's smoke, there's usually some fire. And there's been a lot of smoke around the 49ers and Debo Samuel. He's clearly not happy. And I did hear from a few people inside the building that it's been going on for quite some time. Now, it's been a little while since he scrubbed his accounts, but I think there's been discontent on both sides. Other reports outside the building say that, you know, the 49ers still want to get a deal done, but Debo Samuel clearly is not happy with the situation and would like to play elsewhere. Yeah. And basically, you know, from the, the owners meetings a couple of weeks ago, you know, my, my reporting suggested that the 49ers were very, very encouraged and optimistic that they could get a deal done that there wasn't a whole lot of wiggle room, you know, between the high side of what they might want. And of course the lower side of what the team was hoping that there was, that those sides were close enough. When you look at the contracts being signed out there by wide receivers, that the 49ers were very optimistic that a deal could get done. So it kind of leaves everybody scratching their heads a little bit about, you know, what's going on with Debo Samuel and 49ers have stated repeatedly that they had budgeted. They expect Debo Samuel to be part of the team long-term as well as Nick Bosa, that they could get a deal done with both of those guys paying them what they deserve, but something has happened. There's some disconnect here between Debo Samuel and the 49ers. And it's kind of tough to figure out where the sides aren't, aren't coming together because I don't think it, it is money related at this point because they haven't even really gotten into that aspect of it. These kinds of deals generally get concluded later in the off season. So we're still really months away from kind of a drop dead date of when these sites should work out their differences financially. So there has to be a lot more to it than just the financial aspect of it. Yes. So a reminder that Debo Samuel has another year left on his contract. So let's not forget that. So you look at what happened with George Kittle and Fred Warner. They also had a year left on their contract. The 49ers did get things worked out with both of those players. They wanted to keep around for a long time. Same thing like with Debo Samuel, we got word from Jed York, Kyle Shanahan, John Lynch, that they wanted to keep those players around for the long term. And the same situation seemed to be in place for Debo Samuel, but now one side or the other has gotten impatient or is not meeting what the other person wants and the other party wants. And this is where we're at. Yeah. And so, you know, Debo Samuel distinguished himself last season with a breakout season. He began the year as a very productive wide receiver. Um, and then over the, the final 11 games of the year, when the 49ers had some issues at running back, some depth issues, Kyle Shanahan brought Debo Samuel into, you know, basically a, a running back kind of mode where he carried the ball anywhere from five to 10 times a game over the final 11 games. And that includes the postseason, three postseason games where he did carry the ball 27 times in those games. And in the postseason, he caught 10 passes. Well, we never got the suggestion 
that Debo Samuel was upset about that maneuver of him being called, which he he termed himself wide back. And after the season, I caught up with Debo Samuel at the Super Bowl. And here's some of how he described what happened and kind of his mindset. And he seemed to even kind of relish the idea of being a potential thousand thousand wide receiver, you know, someone who could catch a thousand yards worth of passes and run for a thousand yards as you know, a runner. Um, and so here's some of that conversation that I think is relevant. Yeah. How did this whole thing come about? I mean, the, the first, I mean, you, you hit the thousand yard mark as a receiver pretty early in the season, and then there became this shift of you becoming a running back. How did that take place? Who approached you about it? How did you kind of get the word that you're going to be used more out of the backfield? Um, it kind of came out of nowhere, honestly. Um, Kyle and Mike McDaniel came to me. He's like, we're gonna give you a couple carries here this week, and you know I'm, you know I'm willing to do whatever, whatever to deal with the ball or in like encouraging the team and helping the team win. So, have you ever thought now? I mean, you, you're look the season you had. I mean, a lot of rushing yards later in the season. You know, an average of around six yards a carry. Uh, the, the receiving part of it. There's only been three thousand thousand players in NFL history. Roger Craig from the 49ers was the first, Marshall Falk, and then Christian McCaffrey. All those guys were running backs. Is it <clears> possible <throat> that a wide receiver could be a 1,000-1,000 guy? Of course. Um, me personally, I think if we would have started that on week one, I think it, it was something that could have happened. Is that something that you've well, – will you ever talk to Kyle Sheehan? No, nah, not at all. I, I, I'm just – you know what I'm saying? Um, I'm all for the team. Whatever whatever Kyle asks me to do, I'm going to do it. So, so there you have it. it he says – Debo Samuel said, whatever Kyle needs me to do, I'm going to do. And we've, we know that Kyle Shanahan thinks very highly of Debo Samuel. We know based on what he has said that Debo Samuel thinks very highly of Kyle Shanahan. What I'm kind of perplexed by is they have such a good relationship that if Debo Samuel really didn't want to line up in the backfield and run the football, couldn't he have just gone to Kyle Shanahan and said, you know, hey, coach, hey, Kyle, um, it's, it's, it's taking a beating on my body, or I'm just not comfortable doing this, or I don't want to do this. Is there a way that, you know, we, we can work around this? And I got to believe that Kyle Shanahan would find a way to make that work that these guys can make that work. So that's why I'm so confused about if it's related to his role, why couldn't these these two men who get along very well, and it's not a dictatorship that Kyle Shanahan runs there with the 49ers, why couldn't they have figured this out? It's very odd. I find the same thing very confusing. It was just, you know, a few months ago when they were playing in Dallas that, Debo Samuel went up to Kyle and said, give me the ball. Yeah. And that was, uh, yeah, that was a, I just made a note of this 49ers were winning 16 to seven. And this was in the third quarter. K1 Williams had just collected an interception from Dak Prescott. The offense is going out on the field for the quick change. And Debo Samuel looks at Kyle Shanahan and says, give me the ball. They gave him the ball and he ran 26 yards for a touchdown. And the 49ers, uh, you know, extended their lead to 16 points. So, yes, I mean, your request is my my command, right? Exactly. So it, uh, it's very interesting that that was just in January when they were playing in Dallas and he was willing to do whatever it took to help the team win. And now there's speculation three months later, here we are in April, they're just reporting for OTAs that he could be unhappy with how he was utilized in the offense. Yeah. And I just, it, it, here's the thing. The Debo Samuel wants to get paid. He's seen these other wide receivers get paid you know, Devonte Adams and Tyreek Hill and Stefan Diggs and others. What makes Debo Samuel so unique is exactly that his ability to be a very good wide receiver, as well as line up in the backfield and give a team, an element that no other wide receiver in the league gives his team. 
So if you look at it from that standpoint, what makes Debo Samuel special? It's that right there. It's the role that the 49ers used him in. So if he's saying, and we don't know this, but if he's saying, I don't want to be used as a running back, I mean, I'll go back to what I said. Then he and Kyle Shanahan can work that out. I don't think that's an issue. One of the reasons is because I think the 49ers running back situation will be better uh, than it was a, a year ago when they had all those injuries and they pretty much used him out of necessity. You know, now with Elijah Mitchell back, you know, Trey Sermon in the, in the uh, mix for a full season and, and they would expect more production out of him. Jeff Wilson, a year removed, another year removed from the knee injury. Um, and, and also, you know, the ability to, to sign an undrafted rookie or draft another running back. I don't think they'll need him in that role, but that's the role he was in in 2021. And that's why he has this argument that he should get paid like Tyreek Hill, like Devontae Adams, like the others. But when you look at it, I mean, he only has the one season. I mean, it was a really good season. He has that as a, as a wide receiver, but he's only had the 1,000 yard season. So it's not to the level of that consistency that those other guys have mentioned. So in my mind, if he's saying I'm only a wide receiver now where I think they could have made an argument that he should be paid the top dollar amount of any wide receiver. Now, I don't think they have that argument because now I can't have a hard time saying that, that he should be paid more solely as a wide receiver than all those other guys we mentioned. You look at the resumes of those three wide receivers in particular, Stephon Diggs, Devontae Adams, and Tyreek Hill, and they have multiple all-pro nods. They have multiple Pro Bowls. They've been in the league longer. They are guys that absolutely change the way the secondary has to play the game against them. Now, Debo Samuel, they do have to adjust. Defenses have to adjust to how he plays, but it's a little different than how you have to defend those three top wide receivers that we talked about and a couple others as well. Now, Debo Samuel is a very effective wide receiver, but those three that we talked about really are game changers. Yeah. So it's a different of how it's different, how a team would look at it. And then compensation wise, you know, running backs don't get paid as much. Yes. Debo yes. Samuel is a playmaker, but running backs have lower level contracts, lower amount monetary contracts. Wide receivers get paid a lot more money when you throw that running back, roll into the mix, how does that affect a contract? That would be the the element of this where, you know, he can make that case that he is much more than a wide receiver. But if he's just a wide receiver and still very good wide receiver, I'm not taking that away from him at all. 77 catches, 1,405 yards, six touchdowns, an 18.2 yard average per catch. He's more of a catch it in space and run with it wide receiver. He does have some deep skills um, that the 49ers really weren't able to utilize. Maybe they would be able to do that more with Trey Lance and a bigger arm uh, playing there. But the, the one knock on him, and I don't, I, I don't well, want to tread lightly here because I don't mean this as a knock, like, you know, he's overrated or anything like that, but he was never considered one of the 49ers top receivers against man coverage. And this was something that, you know, I, I've kind of picked up on uh, through the seasons, but also leading into that game against the Cowboys, somebody with the organization told me going into that game. And again, it, it wasn't meant as a knock against Debo Samuel, but it was the Cowboys play a lot of man coverage. So this might not be a game where Debo Samuel will thrive as a wide receiver. And I was told going into that game, and I think I even tweeted it at some point in that week or maybe even the Sunday morning, was that the 49ers expected a lot of man coverage from the Cowboys. And so that would be an opportunity for their best receivers against man coverage to have good games. And I mentioned specifically Brandon Ayuk and Juwan Jennings. Well, Brandon Ayuk had a very good game, that, that game against the, the Cowboys. And uh, and Juwan Jennings had basically the, the same kind of game. Uh, I think both uh, Samuel and 
Jennings had three catches. So, you know, I don't think he's as versatile. He's not as he's a more versatile football player than he is a versatile wide receiver at this point. And again, not taking anything away from him. All I'm saying is he, he's a really good wide receiver. Every team in the league would want him as a wide receiver. The 49ers want him as a wide receiver. But I just think the, the real value in Debo Samuel is that he's a wide receiver in a running back's body. When he catches the ball, he is an absolute nightmare to bring down. So I just have this difficult time processing that what he does best is something that he doesn't necessarily want to do. So we don't know for sure because the report from Jeff Darlington was that he didn't want to get, get into all the specifics of why he's unhappy with the 49ers. I just have a difficult time believing that it doesn't go deeper you know, that there's, there's some other things going on that we are not privy to that maybe are even away from the football side of it. Um, I don't think it's the money thing because they really haven't gotten to that point yet where the money has become the overriding issue, I don't think. So, man, there, there's a lot to be discussed, a lot to be figured out. The 49ers are in a bad spot right now. Uh, Debo Samuel obviously believes that he's in a bad spot right now. Um, so I guess the next big landmark here is the NFL draft because of the 49ers and Debo Samuel, there's going to be some parting of ways. If, if they're going to fulfill his request of a trade, I would think that things will have to move pretty quickly. And now the one thing we know is that any team that wants Debo Samuel, they're, they're going to be picking up the phone and the first numbers they dial are 408. Yeah. You look at also where the 49ers have their first pick, which is number 61. It's at the end of that second round. Now, if they do find a trade partner for Debo Samuel, most likely they're going to get a first round pick. I wouldn't think they would do it without a first round pick. So that would change how they could look at the draft, how they could, you know, look to fill the role, find another wide receiver, find a better wide receiver. This draft has a lot of wide receivers in that first round. And I would think that if that does happen, it's only going to be with a team that has a first round pick that would give it up for Debo. I would think so. And let's talk more about that. Uh, potential trade targets um, and how next week could look. Uh, we thought it was going to be a very simple, easy, uneventful first day of the NFL draft for the 49ers. It still might be that way, but now there's a heck of a lot more intrigue about it. And we'll talk more about that after this word from Big O Tires. We are back on 49ers Talk, Matt and Jennifer discussing this news that has been percolating for a while. Um, anyone on social media, anyone with a, a Twitter account or IG account can uh, has seen this to some degree. And, and we've kind of gone back and forth from, you know, is it possible the 49ers would trade Debo Samuel? I mean, after all, they traded DeForest Buckner um, to, nah, they got to keep him around. They want him around. Kyle Shanahan said that he wants to keep Debo Samuel around for as long as he's the coach of the team. And we often pointed to Fred Warner's contract and George Kittle's contract. The one thing that is different with all of those, DeForest Buckner never expressed any discontent with being with the 49ers. And he, he seemed shocked and very disappointed that he was traded. Fred Warner and George Kittle during those negotiations, which did not wrap up until basically, you know, right as training camp approached, they never expressed any problems with the team. Um, I'm sure they had some frustrations behind the scenes of how slowly things were moving, but that's just the way sometimes these contract situations play out. The thing that separates this situation is that Debo Samuel 
has made it known that he's not happy. So does that mean the 49ers would be more apt to, to look for a trading partner and move him along? I would suspect. Also, if you look back at the way Fred Warner and George Kittle operated, they showed up for OTAs. Mm -hmm. They operated as if nothing was wrong. There were no issues publicly. Everything was normal. They both said they're just going to let their agents take care of it. And there was really no indication from either of those two players that anything was not going to happen. They acted like Obviously, it's going to happen. They believe the 49ers' word. Same thing as we've said about Debo Samuel. All of the front office, including Kyle Shanahan, Jed York, John Lynch, said we're going to keep these players around. So it's definitely outside the norm for all of this to be going on. Yeah, and again, I mean, it's not – you can make a trade demand. Heck, Robbie Gold requested a trade, I think, a couple years ago. Um, while the 49ers had him wrapped up as a franchise player. But it doesn't mean that the team is going to trade him. Um, I, I think that they have to mend some fences, and I can't think of a better person to try to mend that fence than Kyle Shanahan. I mean, Debo Samuel, you know, throughout last season, would go in and talk to Kyle Shanahan every Monday and Tuesday and spend considerable time in his office. And they would talk about the upcoming game plan and they'd talk about life in general. So I can't imagine that there are these barriers set up so that those two men can't even talk and kind of hash out their differences. But apparently uh, that's what it's come to. And again, we don't know exactly why um, you know, our, our friend Field Yates, who's been a guest on 49ers Talk, he did this funny thing on, on Twitter where he said, I've put together a graphic of the teams that might be interested in trading for Debo Samuel. And, you know, obviously it's a 32 team league. He had logos of all 31 other teams. And I almost feel like the 49ers should be on that list too, because even though they wouldn't have to trade for Debo, they certainly wouldn't want, you know, if, if he were somewhere else, he would, they would want him in a trade. But, I mean, it kind of shows that, I mean, Debo Samuel is a player that everybody wants. And um, I, I just wonder if there's a way to make this work. I mean, with a trade, 49ers don't want to trade him. 49ers have been trying to trade Jimmy Garoppolo. I wonder if there's a way that he could package Jimmy Garoppolo and in the Debo Samuel. And that might be too much for another team to take on because it'd basically be, you know, $50 million in salary, assuming Debo Samuel is going to be up around, you know, 20, 22, $24 million, and then Jimmy Garoppolo's salary. But I, I think that this is the kind of thing now with Debo Samuel making his, his, his uh, feelings known that you start to look, okay, wh- where do, where can we connect the dots? And Debo Samuel's from, you know, he went to school in Carolina, South Carolina, you know, would the Carolina Panthers be interested in him? And would it be something where, uh, you know, foreigners could send Jimmy Garoppolo and Debo Samuel and maybe a draft pick to the, to the Carolina Panthers and Carolina has the number six overall pick. You know, would Carolina be willing to part with that number six overall pick? And, and I've always kind of poo pooed the idea of Sam Darnold coming to the 49ers. But if you're if you're trading Jimmy Garoppolo and moving his salary and you're trading Debo Samuel and there's something in it for you, like that number six overall pick, you know, could that be part of a package? Um, I, I just don't know. Uh, but that would be one one potential scenario. And you talk about South Carolina. Debo is a new dad. It would put him closer to his child, which is obviously very important to him. But it's interesting that you say that it could be kind of that dual package with both of those players on the move. I think there's a lot of, there's a couple teams that do have multiple first round picks that wouldn't lose a lot. If they traded away one, they would still have a first round pick. The Niners are one that, you know, a team that doesn't at all. So yeah, it's, it's interesting prospects there. Yeah. And I think the teams, teams you're referring to um, the Jets and the Eagles, both of those teams have, two first round draft picks and both of those teams have a needed wide receiver. Uh, In the case of the jets, 
Robert Sala is the head coach. Mike LaFleur is the offensive coordinator. They know Debo Samuel very well. Their picks are at number four and number 10. Is that too high for Debo Samuel? You know, would the Jets give up the number 10 overall pick for Debo as well as you know, give him that big contract? And if you're Debo Samuel, you know, going to, to the Jets, is that what you really want? I, I don't know. So that's one scenario. The Eagles are another. I think probably where, where the Eagles line up in the draft is more conducive to what they would be willing to give up or what a team would be willing to give up um, to acquire Debo. And their picks are at number 15 and number 18. So I mean, those could be two possibilities. Um, another possibility that I think is intriguing is out of Atlanta. And you know, I kind of open this discussion with talking about packaging Jimmy Garoppolo with Debo Samuel. And if you're the Atlanta Falcons right now, Marcus Mariota is your number one quarterback. And from what I understand, Arthur Smith, the coach there really likes Debo Samuel coming out of that game last season where the 49ers played the Falcons. And and we saw Cordero Patterson kind of work in a similar role as that. Um, the, the Falcons do have two second round picks at number 43 and number, uh, 58. So their first round pick is number eight overall. That seems a little bit steep, um, but maybe two of the second round picks, you know, something like that. So I, I do think that, you know, we saw it with Devonte Adams. We saw it with Tyreek Hill. Those, you know, the teams that that landed both of those players, Miami got Tyreek Hill, the Raiders get um, Devontae Adams. Those teams were willing to give up the draft picks and pay the big money. But you bring up an interesting point, too, is that there are a lot of good wide receivers in this draft. You know, none that have proven it like Debo Samuel did last season. But there might be six, five, six wide receivers taken in the first round of this draft. And when you get this close to the draft, our team's now kind of focusing in on, okay, we want one of these wide receivers, young guy, get him on a four-year contract with stable, lower cost, or do we just go for it and get Debo Samuel? Well, and then it'll be interesting, will Debo Samuel – be interested in going to these other teams like where is he going to fit into the offense well now Kyle Shanahan has done such a great job of using him to his you know to maximize his skill set would he have as high production on other teams as he does with the 49ers yeah I mean that's that's a good question and well he won it I don't think because we're talking about a guy who accounted for what, 1,770 yards from scrimmage and 14 touchdowns during the regular season. So, again, the one thing we don't know is, it was he truly dissatisfied with his role? And everything that I, – I do remember, I think it was after the Jacksonville game, where he kind of made – he mentioned, like, hopefully I don't do a whole lot of this moving forward. But he did. And he never complained about it publicly. Um, We never even heard about him complaining about it privately. But um, he seemed to embrace it. And as as the sound clips we played, you know, whatever it takes to win, let's do it. So any team that would be willing to trade for Debo Samuel, I'm sure would have to have that conversation with him beforehand. Exactly. How do you want to be used? You know, are you comfortable being used like how the 49ers used you? Or do you consider yourself solely a wide receiver or can we use you special occasions, um, you know, late in the season or playoffs kind of spring that on teams. So that would certainly have to be something that any team that trades for Debo Samuel would have to know in advance. Like what are the ground rules here? Because he's a lot more valuable 
to those 31 other teams being used in the way the 49ers used him as opposed to just being a wide receiver. And again, he's a very good wide receiver. He's just not at that level consistently year after year after year that some of the other wide receivers in this league are. And maybe, maybe he starts that string of six, seven straight thousand yard seasons um, after this last season. Maybe, maybe that's going to become the norm for him, but that that's that's something that any team that trades for him would have to consider and would have to kind of iron out before any trade is followed through with. Now, Matt, looking at how attractive he would be to other teams, does this dissatisfaction with the 49ers, which he is expressing, does that do you think that makes another team a little hesitant just because they're seeing this conflict now? I, that's, I would have to say they would have to get to the bottom of it and see exactly what the root of it is. You know, Debo Samuel has not stated why exactly he's upset. And so if a team hears him out and they say, well, geez, I mean, that's going to be an issue here too, or, oh, that's not an issue with our team. Okay, we're, we're ready to roll. But it's, it is interesting how there's this group of these second year wide receivers who, you know, the, the rule is if you're, if when you're a draft pick, your contract is basically, you know, you can't touch it for three seasons. And so now from that 2019 draft, you have Debo Samuel, you have AJ Brown, uh, Terry McLaurin and DK Metcalf. All those guys are eligible for new contracts and they all should get new contracts, whether with their current team or, or a team that trades for them. DK Metcalf, he was out there with the Seattle Seahawks at the start of their offseason program. AJ Brown and Debo Samuel, both represented by Tori Dandy of CAA. And they, you know, the reports are from both of those camps is that they don't plan on going to their team's off-season programs without a new contract. And both of those gentlemen have scrubbed their teams from social media. So, I mean, I, it, it's interesting. It, it really is. And I think my guess is that we will have some clarity next week when it's draft time. And right now, I think it can go either way. Now, Matt, I have a question for you. When you look at these two guys, A.J. Brown and Debo Samuel, repped by the same guy, how much of it do you believe is the wide receiver, the player, kind of driving this movement? Or is it them being influenced by an agent or their circle or – you know, whoever's around them that's causing them or creating this, you know, okay, let me see what I can get. I'm going to withdraw myself from the team and I'm not necessarily create conflict, but the fact that this is kind of progressing the way it is for both of these players, is it outside influence or is it the players? Well, ultimately it's got to be the player, right? I mean, the player is responsible for his actions and the player is the one who employs the agent, not the other way around. So you know, Debo Samuel is is an adult. Um, he, you know, he has full responsibility for the actions that he takes and how he handles the situation. So, I mean, he might be getting you know earful from whatever friends and family and representation, but ultimately, he's the one who has to to live with with the decisions made and, and whatever, whatever the next step is. So, I mean, I, I, I put it this way, not speaking about Debo Samuel, but we all know that, that a lot of, you know, outside influences um, kind of shape how players, you know, react and how they behave and handle how they handle their business. So, you know, without speaking specifically about Debo Samuel, I mean, there, there are those kinds of factors that weigh on a player and influence uh, his actions. So I, I don't know specifically how 
uh, Debo Samuel's handling that part of it, but um, I, I think that's all part of the equation. And it's an equation that uh, got a heck of a lot more complicated and complex over here the last couple of weeks. And, and certainly on Wednesday with the report that Debo Samuel has in fact requested a trade from the 49ers. So we're going to come back after this word and talk about some other things going on with the 49ers and tie up some loose ends. All right, we're back on 49ers talk and Jennifer, I still kind of feel like, you know, I know John Lynch said that it's his indication that Alex Mack is coming back and all this, but I just kind of think back two years ago when they were saying the exact same thing about Joe Staley. And so whether Alex Mack comes back or not, I do think center is a position that the 49ers will have to address in this draft next week. But I do think a kind of a key component for sure is back, and that's Daniel Brunskill. And they tendered him as a restricted free agent at the very low level. So that was kind of a calculated risk they took. However, when the 49ers opened their offseason program on Tuesday without Debo Samuel, with Jimmy Garoppolo rehabbing in Southern California, I think without Nick Bosa as well, who does his own work and does it quite well in Florida, uh, Daniel Brunskill officially signed his one-year tender, so he will be back with the 49ers. And now the question becomes, does he remain at right guard where he played all of last season and the first half of the 2020 season? Or if Alex Mack does not come back, does he start the season at center where he played the final eight games of 2020? It'll be interesting to see what exactly happens there. Obviously, when we spoke to Jed and Kyle and John at the annual meetings, they said that all signs point to Alex Mack coming back. But the fact that he hasn't said anything yet leads me to believe that there's a little bit more question than what we heard at the meetings. And I think Daniel Brunskill is a good stopgap. He's a good guy who could take over that role if necessary. And they've got to get Aaron Banks on the field. I know it was close to it last season. Kyle Shanahan said he was about to put him in there, but they need production from him as one of their top picks from 2021. And Jalen Moore is a guy who also was very productive on the field for them. He's a guy who could step in as well. So that center, there's going to be maybe a little shifting from last year. Mike McGlinchey looked like he is healthy. Mm -hmm. He said, when I spoke to him after, I think it was the NFC championship game in Los Angeles, he's like, so ahead of schedule health wise with his knee. And of course, Trent Williams locking down the left side. Yeah. And so the, the centers that I've mentioned some of these guys before, but if, if the 49ers um, do look in the draft for a center, Cam Jurgens, who's been working out with Joe Staley. He's from Nebraska. Uh, Dylan Parham from Memphis. The 49ers have shown some interest in him in the dream pre-draft process. There's Cole Strange from Chattanooga, Luke Fortner from Kentucky. So those are some of the names um, that, that we would look at if the 49ers were to address that in the draft. And we do talk to John Lynch on Monday. I don't expect any real answers. I guess the only real answer where I would just kind of believe him 100% would be if he says Alex Mack has decided to retire. Otherwise, because we learned this two years ago, they don't want the rest of the league to know where they have a need. So even if Alex Mack has told them, hey, I'm going to hang it up. I just got married uh, in in Ireland. I'm uh, honeymooning. Uh, I'm done with football. Uh, I think the 40 hours would keep everybody guessing because they don't want every other team to look at their draft board and go, hey, the 49ers are, are coming up. Let's jump ahead of them and get the center that we think they want. So they're going to keep it as open in it as possible, I would think. And But that's that's another, you know, to me, that would be kind of the, the one thing that was hanging out there other than now Debo Samuel. Uh, what's going to happen with him? On, on day one of the draft, if, if nothing happens, does that mean it's over and that he'll definitely sign an extension and be part of the team? You know, I don't know. It's uh, I, I do know that I, I think I was just going to sleep in, you know, on, on Thursday, first day of the draft and like just, you know, be wake up on, 
on Friday morning, ready to go. But now I think if, uh, if you're a 49ers fan there, there could be some intrigue. There could be, uh, some reason to kind of keep your ear open and your eyes open and, and see what happens because, uh, Debo Samuel's trade request ha- has brought a, a lot of, I don't know. I think it's making a lot of people around 49er land nervous because it, it, you can't write the story of the 2021 season without talking at length about Debo Samuel and his contributions and what he meant to that team and what everybody assumed he would mean to the team, to the organization in years to come. Now you mentioned earlier that if anyone's going to fix this relationship, it'll be Kyle Shanahan. Do you think it's fixable? Do you think it's going to be a case where they can hold on to him at this point? And Kyle Shanahan can make it work and, again, use him to the same extent that he did last season or maybe less as a running back because he has desired that. If so, if that's the case, can Kyle Shanahan repair this relationship? Yeah, I mean, I think every relationship is repairable, but you need two willing parties to make it repairable. And I think the, the issue then becomes, you know, once you've had some acrimony, then it takes a little less each time for it to return to that same temperature. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly a concern. And I guess I, I have no question in my mind, the 49ers want to make this happen. The question is how open is Debo Samuel to expressing his dissatisfaction And then working with the 49ers to make sure that both sides feel good about the situation. So, you know, I mean, it takes two, two sides to, to make up and um, we'll see how this transpires, but it's certainly something that we'll be keeping an eye on throughout next week. And, and we'll be back here if if news breaks or uh, whatever happens uh, we'll be writing about it at NBCSportsBayArea.com and talking about it here on 49ers Talk. 